Okay, so I think we are like, let me just also do that one on. Um, so I believe that we should be uh, live on everything. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. So we are starting this uh, live about uh, this uh, monthly uh, webinar or live about uh, potentials of e-commerce and monetizations. So uh, I think we should be there and we are live, we are global on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, please feel free to uh, subscribe, especially to YouTube, because then you will get all the updates. The others also you can use it, but I think that's the one that if you miss some, then YouTube suggests to you. And it would be great if you can subscribe at uh, my YouTube uh, channel, Haji Agai, Muhammad Haji Agai. And uh, we start, I think, uh, Manis, you want to start and then yeah. we'll go. Absolutely. So we started this monetization monthly three, two or three months ago. We have been discussing about this for a while. And the objective of monetization monthly was to help e-commerce professionals uh, try to figure out what's happening in the industry, uh, where the industry stands in terms of technology advancement and how to tap into that technology to unlock additional revenue source that uh, e-commerce professionals, online marketplaces, retailers haven't thought about before. So as usual, we have our two uh, speakers, Mohammed and Nishan, and also special guest, uh, Elton. Uh, and Nishan, why don't you go ahead and uh, int introduce, uh, you know, like uh, our show and also our guest. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome everybody. So this is session three uh, of Monetization Monthly. Uh, as a quick summary, uh, if you want to catch up with previous episodes that you've missed, session one, we covered the basics of what e-commerce is, uh, how that may differ from marketplaces or not. Uh, and we went into quite a bit of deep dive in terms of the kinds of uh, like challenges that you know, e-commerce or retail companies face and how you can leverage technology uh, in the AI space and uh, additionally to to uh, bring value and monetization to your business. Um, we talked about advertising, pricing, discounting, uh, email targeting, and, and lots of kind of what's happening in the market right now. So definitely check out episode one for uh, an overview of uh, what the program is about. Uh, session two, we went into a few topics in a little bit more depth. We talked about uh, COVID and its impact on uh, e-commerce uh, and retail. Uh, we also talked about personalization and privacy. Uh, we talked about different kinds of ad models showing up and kind of went into deep dives of, of um, how that affects different businesses and industries. Uh, we're taking a slightly different route this episode uh, really excited to have uh, Elton Shadula uh, on, on the show with us. Uh, Elton has spent the last four years providing market research and sourcing companies uh, for dozens of global uh, uh, companies like Visa, uh, Principal, Unilever, NBCU, Suntory, Fujitsu, and PNG. Uh, previous to this, he was an early stage VC as a, at a $300 million fund backing some of the fastest growing companies and funds today. Uh, since then, he's been uh, very interested in crypto projects and I'll I'll just hand it over to him to introduce himself and his interests. Thanks, Nishan, and, and great to meet everybody listening. Um, I think, you know, Nishan gave a great background of, of what I've been up to. The past six or seven months uh, after leaving my, my old role, I've just been researching the crypto space, uh, trying to understand where things are headed, uh, looking at, you know, what are some promising companies, promising use cases, and um, I'm looking forward to discussing them with, with you today. Good, uh, uh, great, uh, Nishan and uh, Elton for <laughs> some brief introduction. So, uh, uh, Elton, can you mention a little bit, I mean, why did you choose this one? So, there are yeah. lots of other <laughs> ways of business. 
why a crypto, I mean, just maybe briefly, and I mean, this yeah. is a web three that we want to talk more. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, when, when I was in, in college uh, or even in high school, we were learning about like, we were, we were seeing the development of, of Web2 and all these great tech companies growing and evolving. And my whole life, I felt like, oh, you know, we might never have another experience like we had when the internet was invented in like, and when all these companies in like the two, early 2000s were being built, you know, will I ever have that opportunity in my lifetime? Um, and then crypto came along and to me, I imagine whatever was happening during the, the internet uh, development, early developments, I feel like that's happening today, uh, at least what I can envision. And so I see it as like the biggest opportunity of uh, the decade. And I know I can't really imagine myself doing anything else. Great. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's actually a good uh, introduction. So uh, I think uh, as... Um... Nishan mentioned, today we want to talk about Web3 and e-commerce. It's like a very uh, interesting uh, topic to us. I think we, I learned a lot about it. I was doing also some, doing some uh, reading myself as well. So uh, here, and we have, of course, uh, Elton, that we are using his uh, ideas and um, his opinion here. So uh, we were talking with uh, Nishan and Elton, and one good definition, I mean, like say we talk about Web3. Uh, apparently this one was coined in 2014 uh, by uh, Ethereum uh, co-founder Groving Wood. Probably other VCs have used it. And at the same time, this is Web3. The other people like Elon Musk or, or Jack Dorsey, they mentioned this is just a buzzword, maybe it's more for advertisement than real. So we want to talk more about that uh, today. And uh, we were talking with uh, Elton. I think he mentioned a nice thing. I asked him, what's the definition of web? If you talk about web three, what about web one and web two? So that I mean, maybe a short definition would be that web one would be more reading. I think that probably I will say around 2000 or something like this. Then you will write it then that would be Web2. Web2 would be read and write. Probably write there would be, I will say, uh, you do more applications or lots of apps essentially coming to the market. And Web3 is the read, write, and own. And I think that's the whole concept of uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, etc. So I think with this intro, let's go to the concept of Web3. I just gave some very brief things about what is Web1, Web2, and pot potentially Web3. And uh, let's discuss a few words that we may use here. And I think these are important. Without that, probably Web3 does not mean that much. So some of these uh, concepts are blockchain, proof of work versus proof of stake. And uh, the concept of NFT and the smart uh, contracts. And last but not least, also metaverse. And of course, then relation of all of them to e-commerce. So let's go and uh, briefly talk about uh, uh, blockchain and uh, proof of work and proof of stake. Let me just, I mean, just say some brief word that I think I ask uh, Nishan and uh, Elton to add more to that. So uh, in a sense, I mean, uh, 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 blockchain is nothing just than just uh, having a ledger. I think we discussed that one with uh, Professor Elaine Shi in some of our early uh, lives that is some kind of a ledger that, uh, or like, I don't know, book, that history book that keeps all the transactions. And we want to make sure that all these transactions are recorded nicely. Here we are talking about the distributed uh, computations and uh, all transactions that will happen generally, the miners, these are the people who are coming and somehow validating. But this may happen with uh, lots of people at the same time. And these people spend essentially time and energy to validate it. And this is some say by crypto approaches or something like this. But then the issue, there is a consensus problem that several people at the same time may validate a set of uh, transactions. And these transactions might be different. So everyone has some kind of 
local view about the whole world because they may not take all transactions. Each transaction, if you want to do it, you may need to pay some gas price generally to validate it or something like this. So you may not take all transactions as a miner. You will take some of them to validate and then someone else take another subset. And then the issue is that who should get the money? And this is important that we cannot have both of them recorded on the blockchain because then one person get paid essentially twice. So one of people should get it. And so that's the uh, whole concept that when this happens, when there is some kind of conflict, one transaction is validated by two people who should get the money for that transaction validations. And that's the concept of proof of work that generally, again, you could solve another crypto problem or a hashing problem. And then the person who solves it first, that person gets it. That's the proof of work has been used for uh, something like a Bitcoin or Ethereum. But then this new concept of proof of stake that instead of uh, giving to the person, uh, because this uh, solving this math problem actually again, uses energy, electricity, etc., and also make it uh, uh, slow the whole process. If you go, for example, use Ethereum, there is generally this gas prices that you need to pay for a transaction and can be actually uh, costly. So the idea is that maybe instead of solving this problem, that's the idea that is interesting. I mean, that instead of solving this math problem first, the person who solves it first gets it, just do it randomly. But according to some stakes that you have it, so like according to some stakes, randomly I will select you or the other person or the other persons that uh, validated this. I think we want to discuss a little bit more on that, and then we talk uh, more about the NFT and the smart contract as well. Yeah, uh, Elton, do you want to add anything about yeah. the proof of work, blockchain, proof of stake? Yeah. Um... Essentially, you know, I think you gave a great definition of, of how the two approaches work. The, the main uh, debate in, in the community is that, you know, which one is better for uh, decentralization and scalability. So there's a, there's a concept called the blockchain trilemma and every layer one, which is something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they have to make a trade off between three options. So they have security scalability or decentralization and proof of work essentially because it requires so much power to actually validate transactions requires electricity. And because of that, it requires a, a, a lot of different miners and validators and it makes the whole platform more decentralized. Now, if you have something like proof of stake, which is where Ethereum is moving towards and you have other L1s like Solana, AVAX, a bunch of everything else is pretty much proof of stake. Uh, with proof of stake, you can put down your cryptocurrency that you have purchased. So if you buy Ethereum, if you buy like 32 Ethereums, you can run your own validator or you can put, you can stake your, your Ethereum tokens into like a validator pool. And whichever, uh, depending on how many Ethereums you have staked and how big that pool is, your chance of being the next validator increases. Uh, so it's sort, sort of like a probability uh, problem. But the problem with that is it could potentially create more centralization because now the person who has the most amount of Ethereum could technically, uh, you know, get more and more uh, chances to validate the network than others. Uh, but it does re uh, it does increase scalability tremendously, and you know these these layer ones have to sort of make this trade off over and over again, and it's something that I think the whole uh, community is, is trying to figure out. Yeah, uh, great. So I think uh, I think uh, thanks for actually reconfirming my understanding about it. So in some sense, that is the so in the proof of work, you need to solve uh, <clears throat> I don't know a matching problem is in uh, like a hashing problem, which would be essentially matching by bipartite graph, a very large bipartite graph, and that uh, I have <laughs> actually done mining and I know how slow it's done. Uh, in the proof of stake, no. we don't solve this one; we just use randomization. And as Elton mentioned, and that was exactly my understanding, uh, if you put more stakes, it means that you have, a, what's the meaning of a stake? That, okay, you have a lot of this. You don't want something bad happens because if something bad happens, then you get hurt more. That's the reason that you, uh, according to your stake, the probability will increase. So you can think about that everyone, say, 
like you can think about a lottery that everyone uh, according to the stake that they have it they buy that amount of lottery tickets and then a lottery will be drawn and the person who get the lottery that person gets actually the reward yeah, for this transaction and of course as uh, elton mentioned this is the whole issue that yes then it is much easier because it's just some random process and much faster than solving a problem that takes time but the issue is that uh, then the person who owns the most that person has a higher mm-hmm. chance of getting it so it would be again centralized that would be very similar to you can think about us dollar that us dollar is dominant because the people are trusting that more and then they can publish uh, or they can i mean uh, so like money so these, as they want yeah yeah it seems like uh, the trade off that these you know proof of stake versus proof proof of work are making is between sc- security and and scalability and decentralization in both cases is really an outcome of kind of the the marketplace and the players involved is that correct to say yeah absolutely and depending on your use case you might value one of these three more um, you know if if you're like building a game for example maybe decentralization isn't as important as you know like storing your your wealth uh and so like for example bitcoin is you know the, the gold standard of decentralization uh but then you have other platforms like uh gala games solana mm-hmm. who are probably a lot more centralized um but they have faster transactions they might have more usable applications um and it's all a trade off depending on you know what what the use case is Yeah so uh, and I think among the three factors that are actually very important I think thanks for uh, mentioning it so we have this dec- decentralization is one thing uh, the other uh, two was essentially uh, security and how fast we are doing that's the third thing so in terms of decentralization pr- probably proof of work and proof of stake there is not much difference uh, I think say even security probably not much of an issue because then you need to spend uh, maybe i mean proof of stake is a little bit more secure but at the same time for proof of work also you need to do the math problem the solve that math problem uh, that means that you need to work i think i don't think that this probably security would be a big concern here but of course the main issue is that would be much faster to do a random process than solving essentially And we don't know the mp hard problem but essentially like some kind of factoring uh, problem hard or some crypto hard problem that we are doing that's the main benefit of proof of stake now okay let's go to other things the nft and the smart contracts these are these are actually the same concept that based on now that we have this blockchain we have this set of transactions then we can put some kinds of contracts that automatically if uh, you say that if you do this operation if you compute this one then you will get this money this money generally also paid in, in terms of i mean cryptocurrencies and nfts are very similar then you can also sell items the virtual items or i heard like the first tweet actually has been sold as a nfts lots of other things i mean lots of virtual ones especially electronic goods that actually a good intersection is the concept of e-commerce that we are considering lots of the things that are uh, like non tangible things that they are on the internet now you can sell them to do the nfts so uh, elton do you want to add more to that yeah i i think this is like a very uh, at first it's a very difficult concept to accept because you think about like virtual goods and you're thinking you know these are virtual there's nothing tangible what's the value of this uh there's there's many different ways to go about it i would say nfts there's three main uh use cases for it so one is recognition uh when you have an nft and you own that particular nft it might be something that's very expensive for example uh and you mm-hmm. now are being recognized because of it so for example imagine like you have a rolex watch and you know if you if you're wearing your watch and you go and your friends see it people on the street might see it right and your reach is maybe the nearest i don't know 50 or 100 people but then if you have a rolex watch that everyone can see on twitter uh then your reach all of a sudden is the whole world uh and a lot of people value that and i think that the concept like nfts in that case makes a lot of sense for recognition and then you have things like access so there's a lot of communities being built online that you can gather gain access to so for example there's actually 
a couple of e-commerce uh, communities. And if you own a particular NFT, you can join that community and they like there's discords and uh, talks and things like that, that you could access that community with a NFT. And the third important aspect that NFTs bring is authentication. Uh, so you could start authenticating uh, different physical products with the corresponding NFT of that product. And that makes it really easy for you to transfer or sell these physical products uh, simply just by transferring and selling the NFT. So uh, I think if I want to say in short, I mean, uh, please tell me if I'm wrong. The NFT means a generalization of cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies, there is a few of them that everyone accept that. NFT is something that I created for my own stuff. And I mean, and the value of that is something that me and possibly the people believe in me, they have acceptance of the value of this. So in some sense, maybe more local version of these things that anyone can define some uh, cryptocurrencies themselves. And there is some values for that and they can trade that. And it might be just one, maybe there's some unique things like you want to the first tweet, only one person you want to have it. Or you may have some copies of that, I think some limited copies. For example, some of these uh, companies actually, the nice things is about uh, the company called Zedron. They are doing uh, virtual horses. So they are, have like horse racing and you can buy virtual horses such that they are competing in some of these virtual competitions. Uh, Zetran, it is based in Australia. I think there are probably some issues if you want to run it in US. Uh, uh, but uh, because I think there are some, I don't know, some kinds of gambling might be involved as well. But there you have virtual horses that you can sell and buy. And you may have several horses. So you define for each one, then the value goes up depending on if you uh, win some of these uh, virtual competitions. And uh, you can compete with others. And so that's one concept of like, in some sense, the horses become the cryptocurrencies and somebody defines. Of course, I may not believe in the concept that somebody makes some horses and this is the value of that. But as long as several people believe that this horse has such a value, then they pay for that. And this is some kind of cryptocurrency. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was gonna say, I would add to that. It, it's definitely belief of it. Uh... Like there's there's a big concept of that a lot of the mainstream NFTs are exactly what you're saying like oh you know like there's a community we all believe this has value so you know we're gonna buy this thing but then on the other side like with the example you gave there's also a whole business operating behind uh, owning the horse so sure you own the the NFT of the horse but then there's a whole operation of them actually running the the platform the game uh, you know there's like a betting system where people can can uh, lever like put their money down depending on who they think the particular horses might win. And then depending on how your horse performs in that race, you could win potentially like a pool of that money. Uh, and the NFT in that case is just representing that one singular horse. Uh, but that's just a way to represent value uh, to that particular token, which is the horse. And in this concept, you apply this to many other, for example, like e-commerce platforms, uh, and this can get very interesting beyond just believing in the value of that particular NFT, but more about the business around it. And the NFT is just at that point is just like a technology you're leveraging uh, to sell a, a digital good. So yeah, I think uh, another one is the Numeri. That's also another company that they are doing the same thing. They're uh, you are predicting a stock market. And for that, you are gaining some of their coin, essentially. I mm. forgot the name of the coin. But here, you have lots of the coin. But that's also done through the NFT. And just, I mean, just finishing this concept. So uh, do you want to add anything about the smart contract? Um, on the smart contract side, think of it as unstoppable code. So basically, uh, you have a piece of logic that says, for example, uh, I'm, I'm just making this up, like, you know, I predict tomorrow that it's going to be uh, 29 degrees Celsius. And then you would put that into a smart contract. And tomorrow, uh, depending on like what, what weather network or what API you're using that's feeding that smart contract, if tomorrow the weather is like 28.5 or like 30 degrees Celsius, then I would not 
uh, win anything. And no one can change that contract. You know, once I program that, it's un unchangeable. And any fees associated with that, any, any tokens that I'm using to validate that contract are forever gone. Uh, and it's something, think of it as something like you can't reverse. And that makes it very powerful because, uh, you know, there's a lot of applications for that. And Ethereum and like is, is building a whole ecosystem around smart contracts. Uh, great. So uh, uh, now, given so really, this, now really briefly uh, on, on, on the topic of, uh, I guess, like uh, NFTs first. So one thing I find it difficult to wrap my head, head around is, you know, the, the, the value is you kind of described for NFTs seem to be um, around kind of social, social proof for the most part, right? Like recognition or like even access is a social concept uh security as well uh uh why lean on kind of the blockchain for these applications versus you know yeah. um like rolex right like the, the fact that only rolex makes rolexes have provided this this in the past this recognition in the past so do you want to talk a little bit about why do we go down this technological path yep and i, I would just clarify on that that Recognition it of uh, of value accrued to like a JPEG or a Rolex as an NFT is probably the first major use case of NFTs. Mm -hmm. But I think that's only one use case, and the development of NFTs coming in the next year or two is going to be very different than just you know believing in the value of this NFT. the 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 actual uh, purpose of the NFT is the ability to accrue value to a particular singular token on a blockchain. So no matter what happens, if I have a particular token ID that's associated with mm -hmm. an, an NFT, that will forever be known as you know that particular one. And no one can ever change that. And it, it provides true security and it provides the truth in a way where uh, no other system does it. And the other factor is because, you know, like you said, for example, like Amazon could just make a database and give all of its users a different ID of mm -hmm. a particular digital collectible. And there you go. You know, it's, it's, it's still uh, one item that no one else can, can alter. But the difference is when you're leveraging uh, like a blockchain, all the other applications that are being built on that particular blockchain would also recognize that NFT. Uh, and this is called the idea of like interoperability. So if I have, um, an NFT that I purchased through Nike, uh, through like art, they have a team called Artifact and they have their own NFT called um, uh, Clone X. Mm -hmm. And now I can go with that Clone X, for example, and this is hypothetical, but this is where the space is headed to. I can go to another platform uh, that might also use the Ethereum blockchain. And I can use this NFT that I got from Nike and I can go and use it um, at like, let's say like an Adidas store, for example, or an Adidas game. Uh, and this creates a, an entire base platform where your NFTs can now travel through different applications uh, fric frictionlessly and within seconds. And there's not there's no authority to stop you from using it in these different platforms. I'm sure there will uh, you know developments will come where there could start being some walled gardens, uh, but that would also deter people from actually using that platform. So I don't I think there's a trade off there. So the only kind of uh, requirement here is that it's part of the same blockchain. Yes, it's part of the same blockchain. Uh, there's these concepts called bridging, where if you have an asset on Ethereum, you could bridge it to Solana, for example, which is basically what that really means is you're, you're quote unquote staking your Ethereum token. It's just being stored somewhere. And then a replica is being made on a Solana uh, platform. Uh, mm. That one yeah. is... Is interesting, but um, I think there's still a lot of issues with, with bridging. Uh, I won't go into that. Okay. Well, uh, actually, Thank you. Uh, I think that's a very good introduction now to talk more about Web3. So we talk about some basic stuff. Now, why Web3? That's actually some of the things that I can summarize from the discussion that you had. So uh, the whole idea is that in the, on the Web, I mean, like Web2, I will say, <laughs> there are lots of companies. And these companies, as Nishan mentioned or you mentioned, like Amazon can go and decide, or Google can decide, okay, this is a valid person, this is not a valid person. And this is, currently it is in use in some sense. Lots of websites you will go, you will just log in with your Facebook account or your with Google. In some sense, Google gives the identity. 
But the issue is that these are the companies. There is no need, I mean, like it might be Alibaba. And you know, the, this is the relation between US and China. Today maybe it's bad, tomorrow is good again today after it becomes worse. And who knows what will happen to these companies? And if these companies can control everything, so if <laughs> Alibaba has all this, and then because of there are some issues between US and China, then Alibaba does not give this information to the companies like in US that they are using it or vice versa, then, uh, then essentially the whole uh, will go down. So the whole idea here is that we can have some kind of a transferability between these ideas. Somehow you have some kind of unique ID that everyone in the world, not just one company, like several copies of that or several verifications of that exist with lots of people. So everyone knows that you have it. And in some sense, it becomes much more fault tolerant. And this is one, so mm. you don't need to also change it that much from one to other. The same ID that you have it with Amazon, the same ID will be uh, there with Google, with Alibaba, or if you want to sell to some bank or you want to give to the friend, all of them are the same thing. These are similar stuff actually has been used for advertisement or the try to do, do this one, this concept of unique IDs. But yeah, so this transferability and uh, somehow in a distributed way that there is not one authority. That's the whole concept of Web3 to me. Do you want to add anything more to that? And of course, there are lots of applications that we talk more about. I, I think that's perfect definition. Like you're, you're sidestepping the authority in this case, the authority now becomes the user of it. Uh, like, you know, now Amazon and all the big, big names have to rely on this decentralized world, which is crypto, to start building businesses or businesses around uh, you leveraging a decentralized platform. You know, it's very much like how companies before were building on top of like the internet, right? There were, you know, companies had to start building websites on the internet and now everyone can access uh, their websites. And although they control what happens in their website, uh, they're still a big part of the entire uh, internet network. And same thing with, with blockchain. The only difference is now if I buy something on one uh, website or one platform, I can now go and use it on another platform. And this makes uh, businesses work a lot harder because now they have to make sure that they provide value to the user uh, in the long term, not just you know one transaction because now they're, they're switching costs are very low uh, and it creates a, a whole new stake of problems, but also opportunities for, for businesses. Uh, great. But uh, I think it is something that can be, I think, discussed more probably and not on this talk. But in some sense, when you go with proof of stake, this is exactly the danger. So why do we consider centralized way? Uh, because, I mean, they are more efficient. Like, uh, think about, for example, YouTube. I mean, probably if you want to have some... Uh, level of service at YouTube, I mean, Google could brought it up. It's very hard to make it peer to peer in such a, I mean, nice way. So that's the thing that, for example, for transactions, a smaller amount of work, then, I mean, the people can do it. Even the whole blockchain is not that big. So you can't even possibly do it on your cell phone. <coughs> However, uh, the issue is that uh, when you make it centralized, generally they are more efficient. Now, here the danger with the proof of stake is that now if I'm a, a little player in this game, probably the chance that I can validate something would be much smaller because I don't have that much stake. So I'm, I'm a genuine person, I try my best, but still these big companies are doing that. Again, this danger of that you are going for efficiency at the cost of being more centralized versus decentralized or distributed. If you want to add anything more to yeah. that, you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest um, debates, right? Is like proof of stake versus proof of work and all the people that support proof of work. And I think at first instinct, it makes a lot of sense. Like proof of work is more uh, decentralized and with proof of stake, the more money you have, the higher chance you have of being the person that becomes in control. And for example, if you only have a few massive stakers and you know they're putting in significantly more money than everybody else in the network all of a sudden they have the power to control the network um, and change the ledger as they wish exactly and, and like now the other thing is there's a lot of ways to counter this um and like with ethereum 
two, for example, there's a lot of different ways that they're going about it. Uh, there's a great post called the Hitchhiker's Guide to Ethereum. It's very long, uh, technical, but that's a great post if you want to learn more about like what Ethereum is doing to uh, protect themselves against this. Uh, and I, I definitely agree with you, like staking, you need, for example, 32 ETH. At today's price, let's say ETH is 2000, that means you would need 64,000 USD to be a staker, uh, a validator in, in the Ethereum world. And you know, not everyone's going to be able to do that. There are ways to do, for example, like uh, staking pools. So if you go to Coinbase, you could stake your Ethereum and you would gain, I think, four to eight percent. And that ETH would be pooled with other people's ETH. And then you would be able to validate. Uh, and that creates a whole other problem in itself because now you have all these big pools and whoever is running these pools can technically also uh, be considered centralized. So uh, Lido, for example, was facing that criticism for a while. Uh, but again, to dig deeper into this, because I think it can get super technical, like reading Hitchhiker's Guide to Ethereum uh, is probably the next step if, if you're more curious to, to figure Thank out you. how Ethereum is, is uh, fighting that. We can, yeah, we can, we can make a link to this available. And so I think uh, staying on the same topic, but transitioning a little bit, right? Um, like big players, like Mohammed gave the argument of efficiency uh, and, and, and control is the other aspect. They're not really inclined to move to Web3, it sounds like. Yet there are a number of brands that are moving. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. Uh so I have a short list, actually, of some brands um, so like Gucci, Tag Heuer, Emirates, Microsoft, Starbucks, Rakuten, Twitch, AT&T. There's apparently over 60 big brands that are already starting to experiment with uh, crypto, with NFTs. I personally have had clients that are looking at like NFTs and crypto, and they're starting to like mess around with it, uh, funding different projects internally. Uh, and I think it's definitely coming. Um, if, if you look at, for example, a lot of the demographics in the younger ages, you know, more the younger, the younger, the more time people are spending on, on the web, uh, mm -hmm. gaming, talking to their friends through, you know, platforms like TikTok and whatever else uh, people might be using. So I think the world is definitely headed towards being online most of the time. Uh, the, the amount of hours we all probably spend online has become, has, has grown significantly uh, over the last two decades. And I, you know, I don't think that trend is changing. So blockchain is creating a whole new platform for these brands to start building uh, new experiences, new businesses, and new ways to connect with their consumers. Uh, Nike, I would say, is probably the most successful brand to leverage uh, Web3 and blockchain and, and NFTs. Uh, so they acquired a company called Artifact, R-T-F-K-T, and Artifact was making NFTs. And if you were to own their NFT called Clonex, then you there's this concept called uh, whitelisting. So once you buy this NFT, in the future, when Artifact has other NFTs, you have special access to these NFTs. You either are given these NFTs for free or you could buy them earlier than other people. Um, and what happens is as, these, uh, as this community grows and uh, the value of these NFTs increases, Artifact starts uh, working more and more closely with Nike. And in their la latest drop, what was happening was if you owned a particular NFT from Artifact, you would be able to get a, a special Nike shoe that related particularly to that NFT. And so what happened is in seven minutes, when this NFT came out in seven minutes, uh, Artifact made $3 million uh, with, for these shoes and they had never, they hadn't made those shoes yet. They weren't manufactured, but instantaneously they were able to raise $3 million. And mm -hmm. then 98, 98 days later, they actually delivered the shoes to the users. Uh, so this is a great way to potentially fundraise money before you even actually build something um, as a big brand. And, and I think, no, that's just one use case. But you can see how this eventually evolves, right? You so have just to summarize, this is some kind of uh, investing in something that does not exist, like in like or a company, a startup. You may think about you have some shares of that, and hopefully it will go up. So you will have some shares there. So in some sense, you have 
so that's actually a nice way that uh, I think so NFTs in some sense are just shares. So some kinds of that's actually like one view to see that NFTs are just some shares that you can have it. And there is a value can go up and down. But the good thing is that they are tradable in lots of places. So it's not the case that yeah. it's like in this company. You have these things, you may buy it from here, you may sell it at the other place. And independent of even this company. So yeah. you don't need to talk with this company to sell it. It's not somehow attached to this company. So it's like more tradable or more flexible shares that you can have it. And I think that's the whole idea that in some sense you have some shares for these shoes. That I mean, the first shoes comes to you essentially. That or investment in Nikes in some sense. Yeah, totally. And it, and it at, at one point, you know, like the NFT itself is actually not the value, but the access that that NFT gives you is the value. And this can give you access to goods to purchase or experiences. And you would need that NFT to get that. And you know, so, you can sell that NFT to other people. Um. So. What comes to mind for me is a company like Kickstarter, right? Like a, you mentioned kind of fundraising. Kickstarter is one mechanism that has allowed fundraising, uh, you know, from from the, the public market before you kind of go into something. It socialized the concept of, of like pitching your idea to a lot broader community than you would traditionally do with kind of like VCs and fundraising rounds or... or um, is there a fundamental shift now with NFTs and, and that availability? Uh, you, you also have to be careful because if you're trying to raise money through NFTs or crypto uh, to build something afterwards, uh, you can start categorizing it as like a security, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so these companies are treading that line. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend to use uh, that as fundraising. But it is a great way to potentially uh, earn money up front for something that you were already planning to build and you already have mm -hmm. like a whole established process. Like, for example, Nike, uh, you know, they, they already have like their manufacturing. They're, they probably planned this, you know, they, there's actually uh, they actually have like presentations and, and whatnot dating back to 2018 about these concepts that they're executing today. Uh, so it's definitely some I wouldn't recommend it as something to like fundraise money on. Uh, but it. it is yeah so this is something like similar to uh in the music world right you talk about this in in your blog as well um how uh artists can receive royalties earlier by kind of making exactly. their music available so exactly. one question i have on this is i can see why brands you know the the creators of value let's say broadly defined uh uh the, the creators of the consumable value, very blurry in terms of definition. I can see why they would find this concept attractive. Uh, but it, oftentimes, in my mind, these uh, kind of, you know, uh, movements uh, center around moving away from these platforms that have the control and the authority. Uh, is there any reason a, a platform would want to build on top of, you know, uh the blockchain and and leverage nfts yeah i i think personally i think absolutely um i i almost think of it as a whole new platform so for example before there was the internet uh you know a lot of the experiences were in real life a lot of the goods that are being sold were physical tangible goods and then the internet came along and people started to buy virtual goods although they're not you know they weren't called that like when you're buying your SaaS product uh, or like an ebook or something like that. It's just another copy of uh, one master copy, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but you're still paying the same amount for that. And that created a whole new business line for a lot of companies and it created a whole new uh, uh, portfolio of companies. Now with, with, and then you had social media next where companies were now advertising on a whole new platform, building uh, products and services on these new platforms. And now you have, the uh, blockchain world. So this would probably be categorized as like the metaverse and the metaverse would be something where uh, it's mainly associated with gaming. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be 3D or anything like that. It could be any online game, for example. And what, what a lot of these games are doing is they're selling land to different companies and different uh, individuals. So there's like uh, a platform called Decentraland. And if you go to Decentraland and you start playing the game, 
there's a massive tower in the middle of the game and that's owned by PWC. And so like, if you wanted to do your tax accounting, you could go to the central land and you go to the PWC uh, office building in the central land and they'll help you do your crypto taxes. Uh, so this is creating a whole new space where people and companies could go in and they could build an entire experience and now they can sell a bunch of, of products and services that they have never sold before, but it still ties back to their original values or their original products today. Um, and, so and fascinating. Say, so yeah. tell me, tell me a little bit more about uh, like how it ties to their current value product. So let's say I need to do my taxes instead of uh, going to the the branch of PwC close to my house or calling them up or using their website. Why would I want to yeah. go to this massive tower? Yeah, and, and, and by the way, just I think to add, uh, so here actually we are going to another, I think that this discussion is part of the, uh, I think the discussion that we want to have on the metaverse. In some sense, all of this that we are talking is about the metaverse. So I think again, uh, maybe a short definition of metaverse is that anything virtual. So as you mentioned, now you have a, a land on some <laughs> imagine, imaginary land that you can buy. Actually, now you can even sell Mars on the land on Mars, because as long as the yeah. people agree on that and there is no content later, I mean, you can divide the whole Mars before reaching there. Or, Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> a, 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 anything else. So that's the whole idea that now virtually or in some sense or in any imagination that you have it. And as long as a set of people believe in you and then later there is no one who wants to, uh, I mean, uh, go against you, then you can divide that without really having it. I think the same thing that happened also uh, with the Nikes. So there is some uh, like a new shoes that does not exist yet, but you mm. can uh, sell it because the people believe in you that you will make some probably cars, in the, some future cars, you can do it like that. So and these are the whole concept of uh, uh, like virtual things that is like uh, essentially metaverse. So yeah, now you want to maybe answer yeah, both thank of you, these thank questions you for that together. Introduction. Metaverse. Yeah, so tell me why from, from this physical world, I would want to go into the metaverse. Yep. So I, I would answer that question in a variety of ways. Okay. Um, the, the first way is just thinking about value. So if I want to do my crypto taxes, uh, going to PwC today or maybe any other tax accountant and you show them your crypto uh, returns or your crypto wallet uh, address, for example, because the way crypto works is you get a crypto wallet ID and that wallet ID has all your transactions and you can easily file that um, for taxes, depending on like who is actually filing it. But most accountants today, uh, or if you go to like any accounting firm today, they will be very confused with how to handle your crypto taxes. And that's why, for example, there's a lot of great platforms online that help you with your taxes. You essentially just put your ID in and in a couple of minutes, it'll spit out all the, the taxes you owe across all your activity, across all, all the different applications that you might use on blockchain. Uh, so you would go to this tower because one, they would be very well versed uh, in crypto taxes. And it, it's the difference is it's meeting your consumers where they are. Instead of your consumers okay. coming to you, uh, you go and you meet them where they are. And it makes the friction a lot, a lot slower. And all of them happens virtually, correct? Yes, all, all this is virtually. Uh, and it's a whole new space to, to actually sell more things as a company. Uh, so the, the premise here is the metaverse is growing and it's going to provide all these experiences that are not possible in the physical world. You want to be engaged and actively part of this community because it's going to open doors for lots of different kinds of interactions with your customers. Absolutely. And, and also your customers are changing. Uh, you know, if we talk about earlier, what we were saying uh, the younger and younger demographic is using uh, the web and mobile devices and whatnot more and more. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's not a stretch of the imagination that you want to start meeting them where they are today uh, versus of them, you know, learning how to use your product or service. So, so if you're a company that that's kind of figured out what value they're providing to customers today, uh, you know, whether it's it's physical or or kind of some uh, uh, intangible good, what should you be looking at uh, in terms of the metaverse and leveraging? Like, where do you see uh, a more immediate possibility of value creation for them? 
I, I would first learn about your customer in terms of, is this a place where they're even exploring? Uh, because a lot of the times for, what happens is, for example, there's companies that will try to enter the metaverse uh, or like use Web3 products or NFTs and the reaction from their customers, you know, they, they hate it. They get very upset that these companies are actually doing this. On the reverse, you have companies that uh, try to get into the metaverse and try to talk to the crypto natives that are using these different products, but they, they're missing the point. They're missing the culture. And so I think if you're interested, one is, you know, figure out what customers uh, that you're currently serving are actually into this sort of thing, because maybe they're not yet. And maybe it's too early for you. On the other end, think about if you do decide to enter, what products could you serve to the crypto natives and understand the culture before you actually try and, and enter? Because it's very critical space. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that have missed the boat. And missed the point, and uh, they they you know they wasted a lot of time and money doing it. Yeah. Got it. Thank so, you. That that's that's a recurring theme we see across a yeah. lot of like technological advent and companies trying to onboard on it. Right? Mom, exactly. good. Yeah, and, and I think uh, this I mean to just I mean maybe uh, summarize all of them so far. Like there is a Web three we are hearing a lot, NFTs or blockchains, and metaverse. And I think one thing it is a common theme that. In, it is in all of them, is in some sense that, uh, I mean, virtual world. And in some sense that it is e-commerce. The whole e-commerce is talking about virtual. I mean, virtual and non-virtual items or tangible or non-tangible items. And so in some sense, is are all of them, we are talking about e-commerce potentials of e-commerce. In some sense, all of them are e-commerce. A subset of e-commerce. Of course, right. they may expand e-commerce as well mm. to some levels that it has not been there. Like now you can do everything virtually, but virtually currently means internet. So, and that's e-commerce all done over internet. So in some sense, all of them are coming on the internet. Of course, then you may have some kinds of uh, uh, other things that glasses or other things that you may wear on or something like that you may add to that, but all of them are still controlled by internet. So in that sense, mm. that's the whole thing. Maybe in summary, I want to say very rough idea is that whole thing is e-commerce. But uh, also giving some other examples, maybe particular example would be good. Some uh, social uh, graphs. So what's the applications of this Web3 or uh, NFTs for social graphs? I think that was a good application that we discussed. You want to add more to that? Yeah. So social graph, I think, is also another killer app that's coming out of blockchains. So think about today when you're on Facebook or when you're on Twitter, um, you have particular followers or friends on those platforms. But then whenever you switch platforms, those followers or friends are different, right? You can't really bring your Facebook friends to your Twitter account unless you tell them to or unless they find you again and follow you again. With social graphs, with, with uh, blockchain, what we were talking about, the idea of interoperability you could build a social graph so all your friends would follow your wallet account. Um, and wherever you go and you use that particular account, uh, all your followers will be able to follow you. So this is an amazing feature for like creators, for companies. And it also helps companies actually learn more about their customers more than ever. Uh, although it is more private in some ways, it's actually also giving you a lot of insight into this user's activity, their spending habits, uh, you know, what applications are they using? And I think it creates a whole new uh, dynamic for e-commerce to better understand their, their clients. Uh, I think social graphs are probably out like one or two years from now, uh, but it's, it's a super interesting time to look at them, especially with like what's going on with Twitter and Facebook today. Yeah, so so that's I think, fascinating. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in, in some sense, uh, I will say, that's the whole idea, I mean, that you mentioned. This is the concept of token. So in that case, your followers will, uh, will be essentially your identity there. And so like if you are in LinkedIn, if you are at Instagram or I don't know, Twitter, when you, whenever you will go there, your followers will come with you because these are some kind of virtual, uh, I mean, value or virtual, uh, I mean, yeah goods that are there and they will come with you and yeah. if you were coming the social uh, network like for example we are doing on all these platforms uh, we are doing live because 
like the people may have access to different uh, ones and you may be follower at, of me or another person at LinkedIn, but not in, at Instagram, not at YouTube. So that here, that's the reason that I mentioned that actually would be we try to solve this problem by saying that please go and do at YouTube and subscribe at my channel because that's yes. one of the places that you can uh, see all of them. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, also to the audience, please uh, ask questions. I think that would be important. I mean, uh, there, uh, we got one question actually here. So that, I mean, we are talking about the electricity to generate ethereum but there are some research that shows that the electricity that's required uh, to generate ethereum is much less than mining something like gold mm. what do you think about it uh, i think that's an interesting point there's a lot of good studies that highlight um how for example bitcoin bitcoin i would i would probably focus more on bitcoin than ethereum because bitcoin has a lot uh, more demand on electricity and it's probably one of the you know one of the the main major cons that uh, at least mainstream media talks about but if you look at for example like indoor air conditioning um, or I think there's a list of about 10 other things in the world that leverage significantly more technology or more electricity than something like Bitcoin or ethereum that probably are not as necessary as something like, a decentralized monetary system like Bitcoin. Uh, so you also you have to, I think, compare the difference between uh, what is the value that this is providing, and just because something is using uh, more electricity relatively to other platforms, uh, it, the value that it provides could be significantly outweighed. And then if you know if you look at, like, for example, the banking system, and you put together all those different uh, banking platforms, uh, office buildings, computers around the world. Uh, I'm pretty sure it, it will probably outpace uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's electricity usage. Uh, great. So uh, one other uh, things. Uh, so I wanted to uh, actually some questions that also, uh, I mean, the people ask. And again, please ask questions at YouTube, uh, LinkedIn especially are very good. And in Instagram, you can do that. You can always email me. I will check uh, my emails if there are some questions as well. So these are the places that you can ask. I mean, like Twitter, I think is not the best place to, uh, they, they don't allow to ask questions. But uh, one uh, actually interesting uh, uh, issue here about uh, this world, we are talking about the decentralized world. Uh, I think one thing it is important, there are some of the rules. For example, uh, you now think about the cryptocurrencies. During this uh, stock uh, market crash that happens almost now for a year, I will say now, that went down, I mean, recently went up a little bit. So uh, you saw some, I mean, of course, the stocks went down. So like, for example, I don't know, Wayfair, I gave an example in one of my lives about the stock market went from 360 to like 46 or something. Maybe it is a bit up now. Uh, Netflix went from almost 700 to something around 160 and so on and so forth, Facebook and others. But uh, some of this cryptocurrency, they went from like value $100 to almost 0 0.0001. <laughs> uh, so it's a huge drop. And uh, uh, one of the issues is uh, like about the, uh, like being centralized versus non-centralized is that, for example, when you do about a stock market, there are these uh, kinds of sec rules that um, they are checking everything. These are, uh, I mentioned, this is very interesting that you will see the Facebook, for example, when they announced, I think like not this one, the one before, the value dropped maybe by two, 200 billion like in a day. And you can imagine and that if there were any leaks, these people have sold it the day before because the day before, just even before announcing the result in the second quarter, the price actually went up. And then after that, 200 million went down. This is something that actually says the stock market works. I mean, uh, like at least the, the rules that exist, these are very good rules. Of course, we have this issue about the Congress now that the people at Congress now, they know this secret information and they are trading and that's very bad. Um, but generally, I mean, there are some uh, good things about there. Uh, the issue now, when you come to crypto, is that, for example, I mentioned this example before that uh, Elon Musk is coming. Uh, he announces that, okay, I bought, I don't know, 1.5 billion uh, 
Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies from Tesla or my own money. Everyone becomes excited about it. Oh, now Tesla accepts also Bitcoins. And then uh, what will happen, uh, you will see that, uh, I mean, everyone goes and buys and the prices goes up. One and a half months later, you will come and see, he announces that, oh, okay, I understood that it might be not the best for environment, so I just sold it. What happened, he, this is some kind of thing that is called a Stackelberg game, that he's coming, changing, announcing some moves that makes the uh, market hot, and then at that time, sells the, all the identities because of some reasons that I mean, just mentioned to the people, and then he makes a profit of it. You cannot do that much in, for example, in a stock market. You are much more restricted in those type of things. So do you have any idea that, I mean, the, these individual players that they may come and use this, con this concept of decentralized, are there some, uh, some uh, thinking has been considered to maybe avoid uh, this type of things or any startups or any ideas? There, there's... Um... Yeah, I mean, you bring like the most valid point against crypto. And I, you know, I think it's really important what you're saying. Like, personally, from my experience, I would say, you know, 90 some percent of all the projects out there are probably going to go to zero. And it already already started to happen, right? Like you said, there were some that went to like from $100 to 0 0.1. Uh, and the reason is because because the platform is so decentralized, anyone in the world can make a token today and put it up and if they are good at advertising and marketing it and people don't do their own research and and try to understand you know how it works uh they they can you know quote unquote scam you uh, and i think this is something that happens with all new technologies right like for example people get you know scam calls on their phone all the time there's you know websites online that if you go on them uh you know they could easily start hacking you so i think these sort of issues are always a byproduct of new technologies and the, the, most, uh, uh, the most powerful steps that have been taken to date were, was actually recently. So there's something called Tornado Cash, where basically if you use Tornado Cash, uh, you can go and hide your identity or hide your wallet address. Because today with, with blockchain, because all the transactions are public, you can actually trace where every single token goes from who to to where right but then you could use something like tornado cash and that will actually mess that system up and people won't be able to know which wallet got which token so, and so uh, i believe yeah. uh, sorry uh, monero was doing the same thing as well correct so monero is doing like a whole privacy blockchain uh they have their own uh layer one se completely separate uh, which i think would be a whole other other uh, step. I, I, I personally think like uh, anonymity in crypto is probably something that's going to fade away in the next five years. I don't really think uh, crypto is something to aspire to for an anonymity. I think that was like an early feature, but over time, as governments get involved, as entities get involved, it's not going to be so much about anonymity and privacy. It's going to be more about what use cases people are going to start uh, being able to use uh, because I think governments are starting to, like, especially, for example, the U.S., uh, starting to become a lot more stringent uh, with their policy around these things. They actually uh, sanctioned a bunch of wallets this weekend. Uh, whoever used Tornado Cash, for example, your wallets now, the, the funds in your wallets, you're not able to use them anymore. Uh, so things like that are starting to happen. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's probably best to operate in, in good faith. Uh, on these things. And I think over time, it's going to become more and more difficult to actually scam and and uh, do things of, of bad actors. Uh, yeah, so that's like the, so I think this is the whole uh, fight between uh, like centralized versus decentralized, because I think that like in some sense, we like more decentralized, but there are more scams happen. The people can come and change the market to their benefit. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we want, um, but uh, that's the reason that and we want also more efficiency. <laughs> that we go to centralized, but then centralized we don't like it because there are a few companies that they are, or maybe few governments that they are controlling everything. So that is like what would be the equilibrium. I think that's something that 
we should see it in the future. Uh, one other question that people ask also, uh, applications of Web3 or like uh, uh, these topics for advertisement uh, market. Uh, I think we have some of them, I have heard some of them, you may add some. Um, I, I can't name any particular names at the top of my head, uh, but there's two main concepts. One is there are platforms where you can go on the platform and they will partner with people that own land in different uh, virtual lands. And you could advertise your product on their land in like the metaverse. So when people are like in Decentraland, for example, and they're walking around in their virtual world, they could see a big advertisement, a billboard, or even, I don't know, virtual goods that would relate to your e-commerce product. Uh, so there's ways to actually start doing that today. If you just search like advertising in the metaverse, uh, you'll, you'll find a, a slew of companies that are doing that. And then the other thing I would look out for is like social graphs. Uh, that's going to be a great way to build your brand's following in, in, the, in the blockchain world and also uh, to start finding your users because you can start learning a lot more about them using social graphs. Yeah, I think there are also some companies I don't remember, at least there are several startups about them. Like you may consider Google Ad Exchange for display ads. Hopefully, actually, we mm -hmm. talk in one of these uh, kind of, uh, potentials of e-commerce later about uh, this display advertisement. This is a very nice topic. But also, for example, Google Ad uh, Exchange is one of important one that makes a lot of matching or assignment between the places or like the lands on the internet and the advertisers, uh, so publishers and advertisers. And there is a whole idea that instead of Google is doing that, why not a decentralized system is doing that? And mm. uh, like everyone gets, I mean, part of that money. Uh, so as you mentioned, potentially you may buy even some land in some of the publishers page, and then anyone who's uh, publishing, uh, uh, anyone who is publishing, uh, there it pays you. So in some sense, you buy something from the CNN website and then pays you, uh, like anyone who is doing advertisement in that, it uh, gives some money to you. So these are these concepts that also has been used. And again, these are interesting. But for example, for advertisement, and I think lots of other, so one understanding that I have is that is this a new concept, this Web3 and this decentralized generally goes the places that maybe efficiency is not needed at a very high rate, or at least not yet. Because mm -hmm. for advertisement, we need to have these things that like in 20 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds, you need to show the advertisement. If these operations of, I mean, doing all this kind of decentralized way actually takes a lot of time, or like, I don't know, if you want to solve a math problem in the middle, probably this never happens because uh, I mean, that would be already is too much and the people cannot just wait there such that they will see the, uh, I mean, advertisement. Uh, or like, I don't know, the video ads, also the videos in general, that also needs a lot of resources like YouTube, lots of cloud computing. I assume that probably in those places it would be, uh, I mean, we see much later the progress because somebody should provide this one and in an efficient way. And the cloud is one way to do that. Uh, decentralized cloud, uh, cloud. the people tried like peer-to-peer -peer networks, et cetera. Uh, still, I mean, they are still, they are trying. There are some websites, but there is nothing prominent like AWS, Google Cloud or uh, Azure so far. So these are the places that need more efficiency and more efficiency generally so far went to more centralized. Yeah, anything you want to add? I think that was some questions that the people asked, so I wanted to answer. Yeah, I, I, I think those are, that's exactly like the current state. There are companies that are trying to provide like uh, a decentralized system to build like a similar AWS. Like the AWS infrastructure is already, you know, quote unquote decentralized, but it's all owned by the same company. Uh, there's, there's companies, I think it's called like Render, uh, I forget the names, but they're trying to build like decentralized uh, hosting decentralized like uh, file sharing um, that are crypto native companies and I mean I think those are interesting but they're not necessary for for blockchain companies and like look I think a lot of the crypto world looks at decentralization as the status 
to adhere to and centralization as something that's very negative. But I think over time, um, depending on your use case, you know, it doesn't, not everything has to be super decentralized. Um, as long as the users are able to own their own uh, assets and be able to use them across different platforms, uh, centralization isn't the worst thing in the world, especially if you're not storing your like wealth, like on Bitcoin, for example, which should definitely be super decentralized. Uh, great. So uh, anything else, I mean, uh, other applications or others that you want to mention, Nishan or? No, I, I think I think we covered quite a bit of ground. Uh, I see Manas online. There might be something he wants to add. Yeah. Uh, Manas, do you want to add uh, something? I want to give just a short summary maybe. Or okay. maybe let me, I can give you a short summary. I think then you can. Uh, Definitely. I just came to say, that. hey, we're about at time. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. So uh, I think I mean, we have it's done. A, it's uh, an interesting this... conversation. I'm the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's the thing that I generally don't try to limit uh, the conversation, but we want to have this one around one hour. And uh, I think this, we talk about, we are talking about e-commerce on this kind of series. Uh, it turns out the Web3 or all this concept of blockchain, etc., are... Mm are indeed uh, e-commerce because that's all about everything mm -hmm. about the kind of virtual goods and e-commerce is even is more general. At the same time, they are generalizing the concept of e-commerce to some places, like some kind of virtual goods that didn't exist before. And this kind of like, also uh, like decentralized versions of that. For example, we talk about advertisement, we talk about this social graph, you can think about maybe another Amazon. How can we have that one in a like decentralized way? Of course, uh, uh, the limitation that we discuss is that the efficiency. So if you want to have Amazon, like if you want to have a YouTube or other things, in particular for Amazon, you need to have a delivery system. Uh, that is some, not something virtual that you can create, or at least as of now. You need to create some version of that as well, such that you can make a uh, real Amazon or like, I don't know, Uber. You need to have some drivers, not everything is virtual. Mm -hmm. uh, so that needs more thinking. And I think these are like open problems. And that's a very good uh, intersection and potentials for e-commerce in general and Web3 because in some sense they are not that much far from each other. Yeah, so that was my summary. Uh, uh, do you want to have any last word? Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, this is this is such an evolving landscape, right? And uh, like we saw that like early points that attracted people to uh, to, you know, these these platforms um, maybe aren't as going to be as valid moving forward. There is like new and evolving opportunity. And and so I think this is something, you know, we should be monitoring closely. And I look forward to many additional conversations uh, on this topic in the future and then one last thing i would add is you know all these platforms are forever evolving um so today for example something like ethereum or blockchain or bitcoin uh you know might be more expensive um but i think as technology develops and as use cases become more obvious uh and as companies become uh more more advanced and like all the little features and issues with the platforms start being addressed by new companies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in the space, but it's still a very new space and there's still a lot of things changing, uh, but just don't take whatever you know today about the space to be concrete because mm -hmm. in a couple of months, it's going to be very different. Uh, and that's going to keep happening probably for the next couple of years. Great. Thank you. Manas last word. <laughs> thank you so much everyone it was a great talk and i'm sure there are a lot of interesting you know things that came out of it and for our listeners who are viewing this show live or you know like are gonna view this show recorded we're gonna send a recap with uh with uh you know this video and the summary and also bio to our speakers and if you'd like to talk to any one of our speakers about any of the topics that we discussed today please feel free to send me an email at manas at setna.ai or you can just directly send a message to one of the speakers. I will include their bios and their uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything on the recap email. 
Yes. Um, and one one additional thing, maybe we can add links to kind of some really good blog posts. Uh, okay. I know, Elton, you mentioned kind of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Hitchhiker's Ethereum. Guide. There yeah, may be I, some others of that sort, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. If you send it to me, I will add it to the at YouTube uh, or like uh, some like Facebook or other, especially YouTube. Please subscribe to YouTube. I think that's an important one. Lots of the most up to date version would be there, even though if you look at it at other platforms. There, I think I will add the links uh, that some of them I think Elton mentioned if you are interested in knowing more about it. And of course, you can search us and email us. We will be happy uh, to answer any question about e commerce and potentially this. Uh, Web3 other stuff. We talk with Elton more on that stuff. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Thanks, thanks everyone, everyone uh, for your time. Thanks, Manes, Elton, Nishan. I think it was sure. a great one. And hopefully, see you next month for yet another uh, monthly uh, webinar Monday. or live on potentials of e commerce. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.